So if we look at the frontline combat aircraft in production or in development in China, we have the J-10, the J-11, J-15, J-16, J-20, J-35, J-36 and J-50. Eight different models at the same time. I think a legitimate question is, what do they have in mind? You will agree with me that this surge of construction and design has not been seen since the 60s. In the last half century, major combat aircraft have been developed at a much lower pace, either in the West, the Soviet Union or Russia. The cost was steadily increasing, the complexity was steadily increasing, the resources required to deploy a combat-capable squadron have increased enormously since then, so a slowdown had to be expected. And now we have China disrupting the paradigm. So the problem is, in the 60s, the challenge was to increase performance. I mean, kinematic performance. Aircraft became faster, more maneuverable, with longer ranges and so on. Weapons and sensors were devolving and quite quickly, but the base idea at the foundation of the race was the same as at the beginning of military aviation, increase performance. But in the 70s, the performance reached a plateau. For example, going operatively faster than Mach 2 required totally different technologies. Aircraft maneuverability hit the limit of the human body around 9 Gs. And since then, engines have become much more efficient, but also the requirement has increased, so the practical aircraft ranges have increased somewhat, but nothing massive. From the 80s onwards, the competition progressively moved towards sensors and weapons. Guided missiles, better radars, better sensors, better electronic intelligence and electronic warfare. Furthermore, a lot of the aircraft combat capability today is outside of the aircraft itself. Tankers, AWACS, electronic warfare, communication nodes, the so-called force multipliers now have a key role in the deployment of air power. And here enters China. China was in a very backward position, but when the opening up started in the late 70s, they demonstrated a remarkable capability of progressive their expertise. They started copying Soviet or Western designs, but that is history. And China's strong point is exactly in all those technologies where the competition is, electronics, sensors, guidance, automation, and so on. Today it seems that they keep accelerating the pace of development. Just consider the flurry of news we had between November and January. And this doesn't apply only to combat aircraft, but to basically everything. This is one of the reasons of the current attrition between China and the US. Take for example the Trump administration's stance about the Panama Canal, where the Chinese ownership seems to be the issue. These are controversial subjects and they are often reported through a biased perspective by the news outlets. This is the reason why Ground News, which is sponsored in this video, is indispensable to navigate these troubled waters. Ground News is a website and an app that gathers related articles from more than 50,000 sources around the world in one place, so you can compare how different outlets cover the same subject. Every story comes with a clear breakdown of the political bias, credibility, ownership, and then headlines of the sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. For example, consider this story, Rubio's Central America trip aims to counter China, State Department says. The story has been covered by a reasonable number of sources, as you can see 59, but immediately you can notice that it is much more prominent with the right rather than the left. Here on top we have summaries of the news from the point of view of the left, from the point of view of the right, and from the point of view of the center-leaning media. However, if you filter the entries by political bias, for example, if I click left, I have titles like Panama along the channel of discord between the US and China, or Trump accuses Panama of hiding evidence that China controls Panama Canal. But if you click on the right, we have titles with a very different spin. For example, like this, we cannot turn a blind eye, Panama is not going to get away with this, Senate gets to work on Panama Canal, we cannot turn a blind eye, and so on. 
you will never understand the different spin that is placed on the way the stories are covered if you don't use ground news. Ground news is very important for my research since I try to be as factual and unbiased as I can about something that often is neither black nor white. If you sign up through my link, you get 40% off the Vantage plan, which is what I use to get unlimited access to all the features. I think Ground News is doing a great job and I hope you'll check them out. Please support the people who support me. What is the configuration of the PLAF and the PLAN forces today and what could be the configuration in 2035? 2035 is not chosen randomly, it is the date that the Chinese government has established for the end of the modernization of the armed forces. And with this they do not refer only to the main combat lines but the whole infrastructure that supports the combat forces including force multipliers, skill chains, training, logistics and supply chains. In this video here we focus on the combat component and all the new models that we have just seen. But it is not just a matter of new types, there is also a numeric component. Combining Air Force and Naval Aviation, the Chinese combat line deploys about 1300 aircraft. There's more, but these are older types that are progressively losing all their combat value. They keep some pilots trained, but basically that's it. As a comparison, the United States Air Force and the US Navy combined deploy almost 3000 combat aircraft, which will be joined by hundreds of allied aircraft in case of conflict. Not all these aircraft will be deployed or be deployable in the Western Pacific, but it is still more than twice the Chinese numbers. If the objective for 2035 is also to reach a numeric parity, it means that China needs to add roughly 1700 aircraft in 10 years. We do not know the Chinese exact production numbers or their production capacity, but the estimates I found vary from 200 to 300 considering all types, with the total probably being closer to 200 than 300. This would be more than enough to reach the numeric parity in 10 years, even considering the progressive retirement of older airframes and no production increase. But these are broad strokes, let's get into the details. I have some details, sir. Thank you Otis, I pass for this video. It is very interesting information, sir. Yes, the type of information that will make this house blow up. Well. Sir, you would still have the house in Italy, at least for now. The current Chinese inventory includes about 120 Su-30 and Su-35. These include 73 Su-30 MKK for the PLAF. This is a strike fighter that is features most of the avionics of the Su-35 delivered between 2001 and 2004. There are also 24 Su-30 MK2 that are, a, that are a later improved variant of the MKK in service with the naval aviation. And 24 Su-35S have been delivered between 2016 and 2019. I believe that these aircraft will be progressively retired from service despite it being a relatively modern 4 generation combat aircraft. The reason is that Russian systems most likely do not fit into the Chinese integrated combat management system that is being progressively deployed around the AWACS and the J-20. And in fact, the Chinese have their own flanker variants. The J-11, of which about 150 units are in service, is a bit of a mystery. The J-11 is mostly dedicated to air combat and it is the first Chinese derivation of the license-built Suhoi 27s. So it is quite old, at least for Chinese standards, since it was first delivered in 2000. Some sources report that some new aircraft are still produced, but it seems more likely that the production has ended, albeit a substantial midlife upgrade to the BG variant is ongoing or it was just completed recently. This makes me think that if they won't be decommissioned by 2035, they will likely to be considered at the lower end of the combat mix and they will be employed in secondary roles. The J-16 though is a totally different matter. It is believed to be a derivation of the J-11B, the, the twin-seater variant, but it is a much more modern aircraft. It was first seen in 2012 and it is sometimes recognized as the best flanker in the world. 
It is a heavy long-range strike fighter of which 300 units are in service. The aircraft is still modern, effective and it incorporates some of the technologies developed for the J-20 in terms of network-centric warfare and radar signature reduction. The aircraft is still in production and there is little doubt that it is seen as the workhorse of the Chinese Air Force. It will still be in service in 2035 and it will be in large numbers. But the J-11 is not the only workhorse of the Chinese Air Force. There's another one. The J-10 is a multi-role aircraft of which more than 600 units have been built. However, there is a big difference between the J-10A, the early variants, and the J-10B and C variants. In fact, the J-10A is currently being destined to training and aggression roles, and it could be considered the equivalent of an F-16 Block 20, more or less. There are about 275 modern J-10s in service of the B and C variants. The C variant is still in production, it is considered a 4++ +++ generation aircraft and the PLAF keeps investing in it. For example, it has recently been reported carrying the PL-17 extra-long-range air-to-air missile. However, the consensus is that the J-10 main direction of development is toward the air-to-ground role. Actually, in the Chinese inventory, it seems to be the most suited for the closer support or battlefield interdiction missions. In these missions, the J-16 would probably be overkill and a bit of a waste. And then there's obviously the J-20. The Chinese are building this stealth aircraft at a very quick pace. Its early production is estimated to be about 100 units and about 300 are estimated to be in service right now. The United States Air Force itself considers it an excellent system. Getting to the point of declaring in front of the Congress that the early F-22s of the early blocks that are still in service are operationally inferior to the J-20. So, it seems that the J-20 is going to become one of the mainstay of the Chinese Air Force, but there is no indication that the J-20 is a multi-role aircraft. I thought it was going to be the case in the past, but no evidence emerged. There are some indications that the aircraft may have been integrated with some small diameter bombs, but it has never been seen flying with those or uh, trained for air to ground. Furthermore, the J-20 doesn't feature a cannon, a clear indication that the aircraft is not even designed for visual range combat. Actually, now that you make me think, it is a striking parallel with the, the F-22 that was given some air-to-ground capabilities uh, just because. Now, if you consider all the points that we have just covered in the light of what we have seen in the last few weeks, then everything becomes much clearer. The J-35 was one of the stars of the 2024 Zuhai Air Show. It is considered to be a multi-role, fifth-generation aircraft. Some Western commentators are very doubtful that beyond stealth, the aircraft might have features like cooperative targeting or the level of situational awareness provided by the F-35. I can only say that the more I study China, the more I am convinced that if it doesn't, it will have soon. Albeit it started as a naval aircraft, it is now nearing the initial operating capability with the PLAF. And the reason why it is needed is obvious. Have a fifth generation aircraft that plugs the operational holes left by the J-20. If I'm correct, when the first one or two brigades are equipped and the inevitable kinks are ironed out in three or four years, we will see a monster surge of J-35 production. So, where all of this is leaving us in terms of what the PLAF will look like in 2035. Well, by 2035 the PLAF will be radically different from what it looks now. This is obviously my speculation, but this is part of the fun, isn't it? All the flankers will be gone or they will be used in very marginal roles, save the J-16. There will be a line of J-10s to complement the J-16 for operation in relatively permissive environments. There will also be a line of stealth, fully fifth-generation aircraft for operation in contested environments, composed by J-35 and J-20. However, the proportion of J-25s will be large, much larger than you would expect, because the main PLAF operational case will always remain the contrast of the United States Air Force attacking its combat assets and, crucially, the American force multipliers. 
If I had to guess some numbers, I would probably say 400 J16s, 600 J10s, 400 J35s and 600 J20s. About 2,000 modern aircraft with a substantial numerical parity with the forces that could be deployed against them. And all of this seems fine, unless you consider what we just saw in December. didn't see much of this aircraft, so I'm not considering it in the context of this analysis. I factually can't. As it stands, it seems to be more a demonstrator than a finished product. So whatever comes from it, it is probably beyond 2035. The J36, though, is a different matter. It seems to me more likely that what we have seen is indeed the first prototype of a new aircraft. I have been very cautious when analyzing it because of the lack of any official news and the lack of information, but now I am telling you what I am really thinking. I think it is not a fighter at all, but a penetrating broadband stealth multi-role platform. I expect it to cover two main missions. One would be to penetrate contested airspace and attack high-value targets like airfields with precision standoff weapons. The other would be acting as a stealthy command center for drones and UCAVs, which is something we know that the Chinese are working on. In this case, the reply to the United States is symmetric, trying to build something that is comparable with the NGAD and the CCA program. This is obviously a complex development of a new aircraft with unprecedented features. By 2035, though, I suspect we might see it in service, maybe in limited numbers, say 100 units in two or three brigades. I don't expect the J36 being built in very large numbers anyway, considering its missions. These type of assets make a difference even in small quantities, and I bet it is by far the most complex project the Chinese have ever started. So far the Air Force, but what about the Chinese naval aviation? Well, the Navy is much simpler. By 2035, it is likely that two more Katobar carriers will be in service or nearly in service. This will give us a fleet of two Stobar carriers and three Katobars. Plus, there is the possibility that some aircraft will see service on the Type 076 light carriers. So the equivalent of five carrier wings with some spares will be needed, albeit those on the Stobar carriers will be smaller than the American equivalents. Having said that, the Chinese are somewhat lagging when it comes to carrier-based combat aircraft. The J-15T is now being developed and probably it has flown from the Fujian carrier already. It is a heavily modernized version of the current J-15, which is almost obsolete, but it is an aircraft that has reached the end of its development. However, we know that the naval variant of the J-35 is behind the corner, and there is no doubt that it will become the main piloted component of the Chinese naval aviation. By 2035, it is very likely that the J-35 will have replaced most, if not all, the J-15s, bar the electronic combat variant. I do expect some J-15s to still be in service for training and second-line tasks, but Chinese Navy will be on a single aircraft, like the US Navy has been till recently, when the F-35C was introduced. If I had to guess the numbers, we may expect a line of 150 J-35s and maybe 50 J-15s. But what about the J-50? Well, from what we have seen, it is not impossible that the J-15 is a carrier, sixth-generation fighter, but as I said before, I don't expect it to be in service by 2035. Again, we have seen too little of it to say anything relevant. So we have interesting times ahead, unfortunately. So thank you very much for watching this video. It has been a pleasure to have your attention. I want to say an enormous thank you to all those who are supporting the channel financially on Patreon by being a member on GoFundMe and by any of the other means available. And if you can support the channel financially, which is perfectly fine, do it only if you can. Please interact with the video, subscribe if you haven't, hit like, leave a comment, hit the bell so you will be notified of when a new video appears. So this is it. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.
I do not approve this video, sir. It was all speculation. Otis, it, it was an educated guess, okay? Educated by whom, sir? 